worker cooperatives and um, that can kind of maintain living and improve standards for workers, etc. And so I promise to get to that, um, but I, I kind of feel that I need to get a bit of um, uh, base knowledge or, or vernacular between us, if that's all right. So you've probably been um, convinced by Anne and maybe other people that co-ops are going to have another moment in history. And um, there's some tailwinds, like we are getting transparency into the businesses that provide us stuff. And where we don't see what things that we like, like corruption, we can campaign and move our money away. And businesses are shit scared about that and legislating. You know, there is this movement towards purpose-led uh, businesses. Millennials genuinely will not take a job with you if they don't like what your business stands for. And we kind of need the millennials to pay the tax base to pay the super for all the boomers, right? So <laughs> purpose-led is going to happen whether it's lip service or not, right? And there's this other funny thing, which is the cost of running an incumbent uh, department is sort of for a year with all of its staff and its head office and its overheads and its latency in IT, that's starting to get to parity with what it costs to start up a competitor to that incumbent locally uh, at a local scale. So the startup cooperative in Newcastle could get started in renewable energy for the same cost as what the incumbent, be that AGL, Origin, whoever in Newcastle is paying to keep it. So if you think there's beyond one year in that renewable energy co-op, you can start to get people excited about cooperating um, because they've got 25 year mortgages. They're gonna need 25 years worth of power. And people are perhaps maybe getting more community minded. The other reason that co-ops are maybe uh, having their moment is more to do with problems. There is access to markets. There's asymmetry in markets. There is like, um, uh, reduction in risk if you cooperate with your neighbours. You can mutually assure delivery on larger contracts than you on your own can meet. Uh, you've got pooled access, so if we all put in money, we can now buy, as say wheat growers, a flour mill, and then we can sell flour instead of whole grain, and when we sell flour, we all make money. But we don't want that flour mill to be owned uh, based on who's got the most amount of wheat in the ground, because when it comes harvest time, They'll keep, they'll put their weed in the shed, they'll put none of our weed in the shed and we'll all get uh, like disappointed. So they decide to make management impartial and it's not about the number of tonnes of weed, but um, one member, one vote, the fact that you do grow weed. And then your wheat will get picked up according to a fair and transparent process, not based on who's got the biggest investment in the flour mill. So there are problems and when cooperatives kind of get their moment in the sun. It's usually against the context of problems rather than the context of tailwinds and we're all going to kumbaya and do this together. But I think the problem is we've got at the moment, we need to cooperate or perish against a backdrop of climate and stuff. So look, co-ops are just a form of ownership if you're, of a business. If you're going to be in business on your own, you can be a sole uh, trader, if you're going to partner up with somebody else, you can be a partnership. But then you go into larger organisations and they can either be corporations or cooperatives. And um, when I think of cooperatives, I do mean sort of any member-owned organisation. So that can be companies where they've replaced the standard constitution with a constitution where the votes are actually irrelevant based on the number of shares, it's based on an active membership. Mutuals, unions, collectives, coalitions, and more recently those sort of blockchain people were talking about distributed autonomous organisations, thousand DAX, uh, which were to not run based on the number of tokens, but the fact that you held a token gave you a vote. In those circumstances they would fit into my definition of member owned. So there's two types of cooperatives as far as I see them, regardless of what tech platform they run on. Ones that are local, geographic in nature, where 
your neighbours and you get together and you can do something in your community together that you couldn't do on your own. Uh, or platform co-ops where people with the same skill set or the same sort of interest can get together. So that's things like um, Stocksy, which we'll, I'm sure if Anne hasn't talked to you about, I will be later. Uh, where people with the same skill set can get together and form a two-sided marketplace. So when we talk about corporations and cooperatives, a lot of it is the same. You still have to invoice and pay tax and do GST and pay payroll. You have to you know, comply with fair work rules, the Trade Practices Acts, the uh, competition and consumer laws, contract law in terms of keeping up uh, you know, commercial arrangements. If you say you're going to buy something or sell something at a certain price, all of that remains the same. So some of the differences are the word share, and I reckon sharing is a funny word at the moment. At this point in, in history, we've got the sharing economy where it's really not sharing at all, it's renting, but they've co-opted that name. And then it gets really complicated when we talk about uh, company shares because a company share, of course, where you know, I've got a million ABNs in Australia, 998,000 of them are companies and only 2,000 of those ABNs belong to cooperatives, right? So every accountant, lawyer, except for you guys, amazingly, uh, is, is trained in uh, the, the Corporations Act and company law. And so when anybody talks about a share, they're talking about a company share. And the idea with that share is that that money can go in and it can be lost, right? That's the risk. But that money can go in and it can go uh, and be valued at more, right? And the other idea with company shares is that the more of them you have, the more share of the vote you get to have, right? And so it differs really a lot from what we call a cooperative share. A cooperative share you know, it doesn't change in value over time. So if you were in a co-op in 1950 and you put $1,000 of capital into your, you're a grain grower and you wanted to make your flour mill, and then 70 years later, your grandkids are getting out of that cooperative. Even if that cooperative, like Manildra Grains, has grown from, you know, half a million dollars to three billion dollars worth of plant and equipment, you're withdrawing a thousand dollars because your share doesn't go up or down in value, it's withdrawable. Your shares don't carry votes. Technically, if you do accounting um, and we're all taught accounting, the balance sheet for a company on, is that the shares that the owners put in is considered an asset because it could be lost. In a cooperative, because it's withdrawable by the members when they leave, it's actually viewed on the balance sheet as an asset. But for practical terms, from lenders, from investors, or would-be investors, it's seen as a liability, not as an asset. So when we're starting new cooperatives, we very rarely suggest to those new cooperatives you bring in money through cooperative shares. They're just an instrument that people aren't familiar with uh, and they don't act like what people know a share to be. So that I think is one of the big differences between cooperatives and companies. Um, profit versus surplus is, if you think of the big difference between shares as affecting the balance sheet, Surplus and profit is affecting the P&L. So um, in companies, your search is for profit. So your profit then goes back to the shareholders as a dividend or it gets reinvested and you can capitalise that and you get the capital growth in your share or you get your dividend based on how much profit there is. And um, that's the generally considered the motivation of a business is to maximise profit for its owners. When the owners are the members, uh, they, they don't become profit maximising, right? They become member maximising. So if the members are selling wheat, right, via their uh, flour mill into, in flour, they want the highest possible farm gate price because their main business is selling 
grain, growing grain and selling it, right? If the uh, roadside uh, assistance uh, mutual, let's say, is properly democratically run, then what members want is so much coverage and be able to be rescued from the side of the road within 30 minutes. You don't want a huge profit. You want your services to be there when you need them. Mm -hmm. And you will forego profits in the organisation to have services. So a cooperative working for its members will have a lower profit or lower surplus than a company seeking profit because it will try and pay staff well. It will try and put incentives around member behaviour. It will try and put in services to members. So, you know, as far as a, a, an investment instrument goes, cooperatives now have really shitty cooperative shares. And now you know that the enterprise is not going to run to maximise investor benefit. It's going to run to maximise member benefit. So. Almost by virtue of it being such a shitty investment, cooperatives come from their members, right? And their members are putting their capital in to get those services back, right? Not to get a, an amazing return. It's just not uh, designed, for that. designed for a financial return. And when we financialized so much of life, that's quite a shocking thing in 2020. Um, so, you know, it does come down to what do you want to incentivise. If you want to incentivise um, different behaviours, your question before, Anne, about how, do, how, do you, how does Mondragon make sure that workers care? Um, I don't have a cooperative experience of this, but back in 2002 when I set up the massage company that I still own it. We went into bars and clubs and we would walk up to people on a Friday afternoon and say, hi, would you like a five minute neck and shoulder massage? <laughs> I, I'm a three minute angel. And if you don't like it, it's free. And if you do, you pay me what you think it's worth. Now people would go, okay, well, well hang on. <laughs> But the thing, the thing about it that got so many people curious was that, you know, my angels could literally go out to a five minute massage and be paid $5, $50 or $100. And because I couldn't be in 200 pubs around Australia, like how did I know what money that they'd made and what they'd kept for themselves? And everybody used to ask that question, <laughs> except anybody who worked in the organisation. So we have this kind of fear and family culture where the fear was that if you didn't make 30 or 40 or $50 an hour of revenue, you were cut from the team. And it was such a cool team to be on because not only was the each state good, but we you know, divided them into hosts of angels, right? Not teams of angels. And they all had different names and values and they'd compete for the team of the month where they'd all get a cocktail. And if you did get paid $100 for a massage, we'd like make a big deal about it at the weekly meeting and we'd give you a cocktail worth $10 and it was all alcohol incentivised, I should yeah, just point out. <laughs> but you know, we're, I was 22 at this stage, so that, that was fine. But, but the whole thing was that, that uh, Minimum we needed in our budget, let's say, was $30 an hour. Our team was doing $50 an hour weeks. Uh, and the reason they were was out of culture, not because of ownership structure. Like, culture eat strategy for breakfast. And you can have cooperatives with really shitty cultures. There's this group of taxi drivers in a country town that has really nice wine who hate one another, right? And their culture is about as bad as you can get. Like, they're all trying to sabotage one another in their taxi <laughs> jobs, talking down on, you know, they're in the same co-op and they'll get a passenger and they'll talk down another driver. Like, just stupidity, right? Um, and then you can have companies with amazing culture, right? And, it, but, Having said all that, like let's assume a neutral culture, a company is going to go towards profit maximisation. It's going to try and reward the investor's risk with either a dividend or capital growth. 
right? And with members forming together an asset to get the services off from it uh, that they couldn't get on their own through cooperation, it's going to give you a different set of incentives, right? And then you get different um, different outcomes in the business. So, you know, from a, oh, I should have put this in a different order. So there we go. Um, so how does that change governance? Well, we have like a really good example in AMP. So I was old enough, I don't know, kind of got a mix of ages in the room. I, was, I remember reading the business pages and how they made the argument that AMP was better to move from being member-owned onto the public markets where it would have full transparency to the market and it would be um, uh, better able to use its balance sheet, because remember those withdrawable shares, to you know capitalise on the gains. 20 years later, AMP is by far and away the worst offender out of all of the bad offenders in the Banking Royal Commission, right? Contrast that with a group called Future Super. Anybody heard of Future Super? So Future Super started from the uh, same guy who was the executive director for Getter, you know, the political organisation. Yeah. And so he was saying, you know, we've got to have an independent political voice that's not Labour or Liberal, but just about good ethics, right? And then the thing he was like, oh, we really need to be able to direct our superannuation towards ethical superannuation investments. And he convinced a impact investment company to give him a million bucks to start a superannuation company. And he'd never done that before. But when you break down any business, the superannuation, you've got like, you've got to find a mandate and you've got some governing boards and you've got to do this and that. And there's about eight processes and he didn't know how to do any of them. So he had to subcontract the experts for each of those eight stages. And in the end, the average fees, let's say they're like 1% on capital. He was at three and a half percent. So he had to charge his members three and a half times as much in fees for them to be able to uh, do ethical investments than the non-ethical investments. You would think that's not going to work, but they've now got over a billion dollars worth of funds under management, about 20,000 uh, like individual members. And of course, as they've grown, They've got rid of the subcontractors at expensive rates and bought in those lower costs uh, and those competencies in-house. Okay, now they've got that many funds under management. The million dollars that the impact investors put in is now on paper worth about $30 million. But how do they get that impact uh, investment realised? How do they take their 30x investment and put it into the next superannuation for women or superannuation for whatever, right? How do they get their next thing out? Well, obviously, Future Super doesn't want to go on the public markets or sell to an industry super fund having just done that. So it's selling its funds management business to its members through as a superannuation product, right? So it's 20 years after AMP demutualized because it was going to be better, we've got the best performing uh, superannuation fund, Future Super, mutualizing. mutualizing, so that its members can now own its mem member management business. So, you know, what do you want to incentivize uh, and what do you really want to do? All right, so I'm going to tell you a bit about how I know Anne and Incubator Cooperative, which is a cooperative uh, that myself and a bunch started in 2017. So you've probably heard of incubators. There's like 120 of them in Australia. Most of them deal with, um, uh, most of them are profitable, right? They're like trying uh, to see whether this team with this idea can get product market fit and often they don't, and often it takes a lot of time. And to get those teams, you know, ready to pitch for investors, 
They've got to have some traction, which means they've got to have a technical minimum viable product. They've got to have an investable team and a scalable market and all these things, right? So they put a lot of resources into each of these incubators and the clients of the incubators are these two-man teams with a half-baked idea. They've got absolutely no money to pay for all of these resources. So where do the resources for 120 incubators around Australia come from? They come from investors who ride what's called a sidecar fund. So if you put enough people through the top of the funnel in incubators and you give them all six months worth of hand holding and, and you get them to an investment ready position and they have their pitch night on graduation and if they get investment from like external people, the sidecar fund matches the external people's investment and with that sidecar fund they're able to get what they need which is a spread because they know for every hundred you know, investments they make, only one of them is really going to work. And when it works, it's got to pay for the losses of the other 99. No venture capital firm wants to run the incubators, so they pay for the incubators to be run out of universities, they pay for them to be run out of large corporates, they make them ag tech, fin tech, egg tech, whatever, right? So there was nobody asking us to start another uh, fucking incubator, right? <laughs> um, but, but worse than that was we were like, okay, my experience of business at least is that it's never like the heropreneur is that Branson or the Bill Gates or that Steve Jobs is somehow responsible for the success of their organisations when it's definitely the tribe, right? And, um, you know, some businesses are not about, you know, being global, they're about being local and specific. So, you know, you do have the um, B Boutique or B, B Scale. So when you're boutique, you can be like 10% better than the competition, but charge 100% more for it. Or you can be a scale business where you do get economies of scale. Not every business is a scale business. Some of them are boutique. Uh, if it's, what if it's about a long run investment or a 20 year uh, repayment and not a three year repayment? Most venture capital funds are 10 year funds, right? So most of the businesses they've got to look at have to mature and then be sold to a competitor or a public market within 10 years of when that idea is presented to them. And a whole bunch of other things. So we decided uh, that we'd set up Incubator Co-op and the sorts of organisations we were looking to create were mostly local cooperatives or platform cooperatives. So in 2019, for some reason, I can see on the little... Can I have to click on it? Click, click, click. Click, click. Oh, okay. I didn't know I'd animated that one. No, where's the rest of it? Anyway, we did like a... <laughs> last year we did a co-housing cooperative, uh, Rock and Rangers Craft Brewery Cooperative, the Hen House, Closing the Gender Investment Gap or Female uh, Platform Cooperative, Solar Harvest, the Renewable Energy Cooperative out of um, Adelaide, um, a worker cooperative that fell on its face called Tidewater. Um, and our uh, incubator is different. So what we do is we let members come in, they tell them about themselves, they gather around uh, project ideas. So when a person comes into incubator co-op, they've usually got one or two like ideas. So if you're in Newcastle, one might be, I'd really like to see a fruit box or a food box, organic food box delivered in my neighbourhood, right? And that's one of your ideas. And the other one is I'd like to do something with the solar panels that are already on my roof. I'd like a renewable energy co-op or something like that. So you put up these ideas and if people like your idea, 
they can join that idea and you can start to form a project team around it. And currently, uh, as in for the next, till the 3rd of February, it looks like uh, this sort of social media style platform, which is our own, but we've given up trying to get everybody off Facebook and we're moving to Facebook. So, um, every time you have an idea or you bring a team together, initially, everybody's like, yeah, this is going to be so amazing and simple and awesome and that's forming. And then when you say renewable energy co-op, some people think that means solar, some people think that means wind. Some people think that means putting on large solar panels on public housing. And some people think that means using the solar panels on their own roof and what we really need is battery storage. So you might get enough people in the room that all say they're into renewable energy and when they all start off they're like, yeah, this is amazing. But when you realise that we're not investing in putting large scale solar on public housing, instead we're using and solar on our own roof to put into a battery, you start to storm. Right? and you work exa out exactly what you're going to do as a renewable energy co-op. Then you get into norming, and finally, you get useful, but it takes, uh, takes six months, I reckon, to go through that. And in that process, incubator co-op can help groups rather than just a heropreneur founder. We want to help everybody in that would-be cooperative, go through forming, organising, funding and operating. So these 16 kind of steps don't have to be done sequentially, but before you can really launch a cooperative, they all have to be done. And I want to contrast this for a second. When I want to start a, a oh shit, Real world example. When I wanted to start the the uh, search engine pre Google, I just went and got um, an accountant to go to ASIC, spend four hundred dollars and twenty five minutes, and I had a company. And the first thing I did was run around and I gave sweat for equity to people to build a team. And then you, with a team on board, at least on a piece of paper. You can then go sell vaporware to investors. And I stupidly managed to get some of that, right? <laughs> and, and the investors knew what they were buying. The sweat for equity people knew what they were buying. Because I had shares that were technically worthless but could be worth something, and because I had an ABN, I could get a bank account. When you're a cooperative, you don't have an ABN until you've registered with the um, uh, state authority. And you can't register with the state authority until you've got a disclosure statement. And to have your disclosure statement, you have to know your financial model you know, and projections. And to know your financial model, you have to definitely know your member value proposition and your active membership test. And all of that needs to be worked out. So it's six months of hard work for everybody before you can even get an ABN which will give you a bank account, right? And who's going to do that work that needs to be done pre-formation? And what reward do they get for doing that work? And how does the community work that out? Well, that's the main problem that we do solve with Incubator co -op. The other stuff we do is to help them with financial projections, choosing how to build a disclosure statement or a constitution. That's credit to Anne and uh, Robin Donnelly for yeah. building that. Mainly Robin, we haven't talked about it yet. And putting in software. So, you know, if you put in MailChimp, the sort of software where every week you're emailing a newsletter out to people, mm -hmm. that looks like that before side. If you put in a social networking software where anybody can talk to anyone, that looks like the after side. So, you know, we want in a member-owned organisation, instead of that command and control, you want that engagement. Um, okay, but the biggest problem we have is we've got six months of everybody needing to do work and nothing to give them in return like sweat for equity and no idea whether this is even going to work. So we've got these uh, 
trust gaps that we need to bridge. Which, you know, in a perfect world wouldn't need to be bridged. You'd just have the idea and you'd contract it and away you'd go. But over time things change and people have different expectations. So instead you agree something and then changes and then it's like biffo. But fortunately for us, there's a whole bunch of new lawyers coming through to add to the already uh, amazing amount of lawyers. And you guys help us go to court and get, make it legal. And I'm like, well, what if we didn't go to contract level and engage the lawyers? What if as members of Incubator Co-op, you're engaged in a treaty? Things you've already agreed to that are not legally enforceable, but are morally enforceable as a member of Incubator Co-op. So in your treaty, you might say, I'll do the financial projections for the solar energy community cooperative, uh, but when the co-op has a surplus within the next few years, it needs to pay me for the time that I put into putting in its uh, financials. Plus, maybe an extra 300 bucks because there's a risk I'll never get paid, right? And everybody else who's a member of Incubator Co-op and around that project can say on behalf of the project, pre-ABN and pre-bank account, yeah, we reckon that's all right. And so you form a treaty. Now, what happens is you end up needing to do more financials than you thought. It's not just a PL and l and a balance sheet and a forecast. You actually need to do um, some bank loan applications and you're the only one who understands the figures. You should be able to, without having to go to lawyers for an organisation that doesn't have an ABN or a bank account, and say, hey, I'm doing more work than we originally thought. And everybody goes, yes, you are. Can we up the rate? Yes, we can. And so, treaties live in various states. One is where they're current, as in you're still working through the process of agreeing what needs to be done to get your organisation up. Uh, resolved is where a treaty is like gone from um, all parties are interested to no parties are interested, and we've just gone, oh well, all bets are off, right? Uh, Broken treaty is where one person has said, hey, uh, I did the financials, we've now got like a surplus, but you bastards haven't paid me, right? <laughs> That's a broken treaty. Uh, and the risk, uh, I'll go into that, or a converted treaty is where, hey, we've done the financials, done the model, we've now got solar panels, we're making a surplus, Let's take this informal agreement and convert it to a legal agreement where the legal agreement now will just require the lawyers to copy the terms in mirror from the treaty across to the contract. You might be paying for half an hour instead of hours and hours. Blockchain immutable, but it costs us so much to uh, process an uh, Ethereum-based uh, uh, treaty and the treaties have got, you know, uh, dubious value that we just are using a thing called Ultradox uh, on a Google sheet, on like a Google ba basis. Um, but either the drivers in Uber's case, or if you're talking about Deliveroo, the restaurants who can't sell without going through one of these like Uber Eats or Deliveroo or um, Urban Spoon or whatever they are. The other thing with these two-sided marketplaces is they tend to be a winner takes all. So lots of so an Uber for massage, no shit. Tried to do this one, didn't work. Uh, Uber for massage. There are about uh, twenty players globally trying to go for that uh, market. We all raised half a million to a million dollars. Uh, one of them is on top, uh, called Soothe. Uh, and the rest have all had all their investment go in to kind of validate the, the market, but none of them are going to have the size. Additionally, the one that has one, if anybody looks like they've got the size, they've now got the balance sheet to buy them for equity. So they'll do one or two uh, Acqui hire uh, trade sales using script, but pretty much, you know, you won't 
go in five or ten years' time to you know the yellow pages to find a massage, you'll have it on your app the same way as you do with Uber Eats for your food and your transport. You'll have a massage or wellness app that connects you to a two-sided marketplace. Like your airlines, you don't go to Qantas anymore, you go to uh, Webjet or whatever it is. Two-sided marketplaces um, can be owned by one of the sides of the market. So instead of them being extortionate, uh, sort of middleman rent-seeking where the only game in town is on their platform, you can have something like Stocksy. So, um, before Stocksy started, iStock and Getty Images, on average, used to tell people, you can not choose as a photographer what the price is for your photos. We will decide that based on how many pixels it is, not based on any objective or subjective other value. When we've chosen the price for your uh, photo, we'll keep 80 cents in every dollar that's paid for it and we'll give you 20 cents in every dollar for it. Because nobody is going to discover your photos, Mr. Photographer. Uh, and if you want a slice of this online marketplace for images, this is how you play. So iStock Photo was uh, founded by the guys that then founded Stocksy United. And they went, you know, this is, this is shithouse. I reckon we should have the highest quality uh, photos and we should let our photographers decide how much each photo is worth, whether it's 50 cents or $5 for that particular photo. And I reckon we've just got to do a, a fairly simple tech platform and a lot of advertising. I reckon we could have our photographers keep 80% and we could run the platform on 20%. So Stocksy now um, still only has 1,000 photographers, but their average income is five times the average income for photographers globally. They have 10,000 photographers on a waiting list, waiting for some members to withdraw. They have changed, yeah, complete close shot. Yeah, like, they have changed what iStock and Getty now pay photographers by about 20%. Uh, so <coughs> iStock and Getty, in order to keep photographers from going out and creating another Stocksy, right, are now paying 40 cents and keeping 60 cents instead of paying 20 cents and 80 cents. So having a two-sided marketplace, particularly given that the technology is not the barrier, usually in um, two-sided marketplaces, it goes like this. One, you've got to have the technology to map match people. Then you've got to go out and get your service providers on. And you've got to get customers on quick enough that your service providers don't starve and go, nah, there's nothing in this platform. In order to get those three things to happen, you generally, as a startup team of two, will need to employ capital and deploy capital, right? Uh, when that comes from a thousand photographers, the capital that they're going to deploy is not on engaging suppliers. The technology will be the same, whether it's a cooperative or a company building that technology. They can put any of the money they rest from their, they, they gain from their member pools, who becomes their service providers, purely on getting the customers, right? So they've got a more efficient path to market, less cost per customer acquisition because they've got no supply costs, right? So in two-sided marketplaces, which traditionally lower the, the um, value that people are getting and extract it to Silicon Valley-backed, venture capital-backed organisations, what they call the platform <coughs> cooperatives like Stocksy is really cool. So everyone's a contractor. If you've got a job these days, that's amazing because most people have been turned into independent contractors. Um, so the platform cooperative in Europe started off in Brussels, started off with artists and musicians, and they have terrible cash flow, uh, possibly because they're artists and musicians and they're not really geared towards doing their 
invoices and you know chasing receivables and and doing their business stuff uh, but also in summer when the festival seasons are on they're busy 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 doing their work doing their music doing their art installations and then they starve through winter and when they're busy they're not doing their financial work and when they're starving they're trying to chase bills that are now 60 90 days old and people go on, right so what smart did was they basically stepped in and said okay you can work as a contractor uh, and we will pay you as an employee so we will like pay you every week including your superannuation equivalent and we'll pay you as soon as you raise an invoice for a gig that you're going to do but it'll be our job to collect from that gig that you did when you get paid for that we're going to take out something like 10 cents in the dollar now that became um uh, it grew and grew and grew outside of Brussels into most of the other European countries. But where it really got cool was things like Deliveroo in um, Brussels. They can't do direct contractors. So if you want to become a Deliveroo rider on your bicycle, you join Smart. And then you become an employee of Smart. And then Smart contracts you with Deliveroo. So that way you're going to get your superannuation, you're going to get your weekly pay, you're going to have insurance covered for you in case of accident. If you do this as an independent contractor, there's no guarantee you're going to get um, uh, insurance. You may remember to put your superannuation to the side, but you probably won't. And if you get you know, laid off, you've got no uh, income. So they support one another. Uh, they mutualise the risk. They're much better with a couple of hundred million dollars as smart cooperative collecting from large organisations on time than a whole bunch of artistic independent contractors could ever be. So another thing that's driving um, cooperatives is localism. So you guys have obviously studied Mondragon uh, or the Cleveland model. Um, there's also this thing called the Preston model, which is, Preston is a UK town which was suffering, and the way that they turned their thing around is essentially a combination of uh, social procurement, getting the universities, um, the hospitals, the city itself, the council itself, to start purposefully favouring local businesses to provide parks maintenance, gardening, food, uh, cleaning services, uh, repairs and maintenance on buildings. And by just changing that, they suddenly created a demand. And then they had lots of unemployment and people going with the need for training. So they created worker-owned cooperatives amongst the unemployed people or the people doing training to then match the procurement needs of local institutions. And what do you know? People got a decent job, they started spending money in the economy, uh, people had pride in the uh, cooperative that they were working with, uh, people had pride in the organisations that were procuring locally, they had more patience for things that were late, they would handle a whippersnipper going on earlier on a summer morning uh, or staying on later than they otherwise would. Preston has kind of set the world alight. Um, what's amazing is how much so. So the city of Sydney, um, I've just been speaking last week with, um, not close them all, Jess Scully, the deputy mayor. And I'm, she's one of the most articulate people about uh, localism and the local economics and how to develop using the Preston model or um, using the commons that I've ever heard. Uh, and what really surprised me was then I went through uh, their organisation and got speaking to the person in charge of people, performance and technology. And he was again incredibly well versed in platform co-ops 
And I'm like, how do you guys know all about this? Like, no one in the co-op sector knows about procurement and platform co-ops as well as you guys do. And it turns out that they are in the process of incubating a whole bunch of uh, worker-owned cooperatives to meet their own procurement needs. They've been working with UTS, University of Sydney, and a whole bunch in um, uh, Camperdown, Ultimo, as uh, uh, these are large organisations like Fishburners and Optus and stuff like that to do their procurement and become better neighbours. Um, they've got localisation plans uh, around education and training in Woolloomooloo. There's uh, already any of the existing co-ops that are members of uh, Co-ops New South Wales can be put on a uh, procurement um, platform that City of Sydney uses called, I think I wrote it down, um, maybe it's called In Procure or Procure In or something. So they are purposefully uh, favouring worker-owned cooperatives, uh, cooperatives in general, and are trying to help incubate them. There's a large amount of literacy in Australia, uh, particularly in the city of Sydney. Darabin Council as well. Um, so th this group, Loconomics, they originally started in the States, but then they came to Australia. In the States, they were doing one thing, uh, and in the, they were trying to do a two-sided marketplace in, in the States, a bit like Smart. They were hoping to help those who were casualised and contracted out of their worker rights to be able to have worker rights, yet still get jobs with the two-sided marketplaces. Here in Australia, we had a different problem. So here we've got lots of ABM subcontractors and Darabin Council saying, I want to put on an event in our local park. I need security, port a uh, ticketing staff, I need uh, like oh and staff. And what Loconomics does is it sits there as a platform cooperative where the event planners and the cleaners and the maintenance people, they all can organise themselves on Loconomics to come together to pitch for a large piece of work that Darabin Council couldn't put out in a hundred mini tenders, puts out in its normal process, then Loconomics divides that into a hundred bits of work that go out to subcontractors who all own Loconomics on a one member, one vote basis. Fortunately, Loconomics is um, about to pick up a grant uh, and help them with their technology. But it's really cool to see um, City of Sydney and City of Darabin working with uh, worker-owned cooperatives to make them uh, work and to give social procurement. It's our own version of the Preston model. Succession. So there's still only like three ways that you get rich. One is you uh, sell to your competitors, which is called a trade sale. Uh, the other is you sell to the public markets, which is called an IPO. And the third one, which is, you know, very out of fashion, is you sell to your employees. So that used to be called a management buyout. But it so seldom happens now because the premium you get on an IPO or the premium you get on a trade sale. So there's only three ways as an entrepreneur or an investor to get your capital back. Door one, uh, IPO. Door two, trade sale. Door three, management buyer. However, there is, um, there is a twist on the management buyer that employee ownership is now starting to allow for. So there are investment funds that will match funds with employees to help those employees pull the capital together to start buying out in stages uh, organisations and founders so the investors can get their money out. Maybe they won't get it out at 10x like a trade sale or 100x like an IPO. They might get it out at 3x. But that's better than not getting it out at all. Um, some of those, like an example, um, 
if they don't give uh, employee ownership support, we're going to have a real problem. So most of Australia's 998,000 companies are owned by stale male pale people <laughs> who are going to retire and haven't got a succession plan. It's actually a real issue. <laughs> Um, and we need employee ownership and worker-owned cooperatives to take over from these uh, family-run or mid-sized companies, or there just simply isn't enough large companies to buy all of those mid-sized companies, and they'll shut as the founders want to shut down because they won't have another exit mechanism. They're not big enough to IPO or trade for. Uh, yeah. Sorry, just going through. So I can talk to you about the uh, hen house yeah. if you want. Just quickly, just to, yeah. yeah. Okay, so hen house, which was one of the uh, incubatees that came through incubator co last in 2019. It was founded by a lady called Moira Ware, who won a, uh, an Australia Day recognition, an AM, because she was already hugely connected within the women in South Australia, particularly in the volunteer and community sector. Anyway, she noticed that women were awesome at supporting women in many ways, uh, but one of the things holding women back was access to capital. So she did a bit of a hunt around, and what she found was that, you know, we're closing the wage payment gap, but if the uh, employment gap is going to shut in like 20 years, the gender investment gap is not going to shut for another 200 years. And the gender investment gap, uh, investing in female founded businesses as opposed to stale male and pale business, uh, businesses doesn't make much sense. So in 2018, it was like 4% of venture capital went to female founded businesses, but female founded businesses outperformed the average by 40%. So capitalists were missing out on getting supersized returns by not investing in women. So Moira put these two ideas, closing the gender investment gap and supporting women to invest in other women together. So Hen House was born. Um, it does, uh, <laughs> does a few things. So it does its own incubator, being a Hen House, uh, and it incubates cooperatives. Uh, women come up with ideas, they match them with social procurement needs, uh, they help them out. And at the end of that incubator, hopefully a new social enterprise focused female founded uh, business is born. Another one is called Give a Cluck. Uh, so <laughs> they ask that there are 2,000 or 3,000 odd women in the Facebook uh, group, what are you going to do to give a cluck? Are you going to uh, mentor? Are you going to provide a board experience to a female? Or are you going to put money into a fund that we can then invest in female funded businesses? Um, when it comes to the mentoring, they're really savvy. So people don't really want to be mentored by people they don't get along with. So if you match mentors based on skills, you know, you might get like a young creative uh, immigrant woman matched with a ex-bureaucrat kind of political uh, beast out of South Australia and they don't know how to work together. So mentoring becomes a much more structured thing within Chooks uh, that enables people to have like three-way and four-way mentoring. So you put in a, a, a group mentor uh, as opposed to an individual mentor and you rotate the focus. Uh, so they do amazing things uh, as a platform co-op, they're what about just the starting. Women? Didn't they set up a co-op? Yeah, so they have. Uh, one of their one of their funders, or one of the things that they could get funding with because of the volunteers and community, is they can 
they could get like a philanthropy money that came to a group of say migrant women or women just out of prison and those women could get a grant for five or ten thousand dollars to start a new business and then they spend that money with um, hen house to get incubated mm -hmm. so uh, they originally got given a seventy thousand dollar grant to do seven of those businesses those migrant women i'm not sure which group that was but some of the businesses that have come out have been really cool mm. the one I, I like best is is not it's in this cohort but it's called damsel and it's uh, without all the distress and it's women helping women to change light bulbs change tires and like be independent uh and, like sharpen the blades on your lawnmower i have no idea how to do that <laughs> you know the like really practical stuff and damsel has the potential to help these people who know how to do stuff but just haven't been given business skills um, and come from a pretty disadvantaged background and then suddenly they can be helping women who might you know otherwise be considered well off to do shit for themselves and uh, it's a really empowering thing. Um, yeah, I love Hen House too because the, the board, I sit on a few boards, the most functional board I've met uh, is the Hen House women. They're like incredible. They're like the best business people I've dealt with. Yeah. I'm pretty much done, but I can answer questions. You probably want to go home, you know, <laughs> but um, can help with co op formation or funding uh, or other questions we've got. I was a little bit switched off at the beginning trying to set up this, but did you, did you mention Commonwealth? Did you? No, I didn't mention Commonwealth. Okay, so, um, so on the 27th and 28th of February at UTS in Ultimo, I've got a, an event happening over the, fir the, the first day is 16 kind of TEDx style talks. And then the second day is three two-hour roundtables. So in my world, it's like crowdfunding. So uh, I've invited all the people from the Crowdfunding Institute, where I used to organise their annual conference, to come to Commonwealth. And we're going to talk about how when you give stakeholders an actual stake, how does that change the running of the business? So we talk to people like Food Connect, who got uh, $2 million from 513 careholders over a three month campaign. They had been living in, the, uh, sorry, releasing a uh, part of a shed to do their food delivery box of organic food direct from farmers to Brisbane people. The opportunity came up to go from leasing the shed to buying the whole space. So they went out to their crowd, got two million dollars to buy the place and turn it into a fair food hub. Now all those people came in via equity crowdfunding. They pur purchased on the opposite promise of a unicorn. They, they purchased because they were offered a fair food system, right? And um, they managed to break the 2018 record. The 2019 record was set by Sheba and it's an all-female Uber. So women finishing work or getting their kids picked up from school and taken to sport can feel comfortable that the only people driving are women and that they've all had working with children, vets and, poli uh, and other police checks. So equity crowdfunding is really about the crowd and not so much the funding, although most of the industry has it ass about. They think that they're finding the next unicorn when actually the unicorns are preferring to go with venture capital, not with the crowd. Crowdfunding is where you get a committed group of people who decide we want a fair food system and our quickest way to get there is to buy this food hub and then fill it with Oz Harvest and other sub-tenants uh, like a craft brewery to go around the food box delivery distribution business and so when the crowd says we want something then the funding becomes quite a norm so that's one of the crowds at commonwealth the other crowd is co-ops so through incubator co-op i know most of the emerging 
ideas for co-ops in Australia. And what they suffer with is, you know that share issue? How do you get money into a cooperative? Um, particularly if that cooperative isn't profit-centred and if my shares don't carry a vote, as an investor, there's a lot of other safer places to park your money. So we need to make instruments that work uh, for investors and work for the cooperative. And so some of those instruments are like prepayments for renewable energy. So if you do that, you circumvent the um, financial disclosure and financial regulations that require you to do an offer document. Because pre-purchasing a service or a good like power is different than buying a share. Uh, and then there's other novel financial instruments that the co-op sector need to talk about. And the third sector is place-based economy. So that is things like the Preston model where you're looking at procurement. Uh, so we've got social traders there. We've got about $600 million worth of procurement contracts that they uh, deliver to social enterprises around Australia. So those three things are all coming together uh, at UTS Centre for Business and Social Innovation. Uh, the first day is 16 speakers giving you a whole flavour of when stakeholders have a stake. And then the day two is an equity crowdfunding roundtable. We're going to ask uh, ASIC why were there like 15 licensed intermediaries and eight of them didn't post a single deal yet? Um, what? What, why have we had 55 companies out of a million ABNs use equity crowdfunding and they've raised a paltry 39 million bucks? Eight million of that was for craft beer. You know, eh, that's saying something about Australia's habits. <laughs> um, that's the equity crowdfunding round table. The second round table is uh, the Business Council of Co-ops and Mutuals talking about innovation exchange between, say, the blockchain Neo mutuals uh, and the existing health fund mutuals. What can they learn from one another uh, about actuary and transparency and single uh, entry um, of data and privacy? Uh, and then the third one is the catalyzing of a thing called the Sydney Commons Lab, which is basically working with the City of Sydney, the anchor institutions of UTS, etc to try and get a commons lab permanently established. So um, one of the best examples of commons recently, it isn't for Newcastle, but it is for Sydney, is they had all these bushwalks all around Sydney Harbour, but when uh, civic society said, well, why don't we join all these bush trails, and now you can walk from Bondi to Manly around Sydney Harbour, 50 kilometres continuously, that's a commons because it's changed our obesity, our health, our tourism attractions, it's brought money into it. But there was no company or, or profit motive that was ever going to get uh, the 50 kilometre Bondi to Manly bushwalk created. It was commoning. So how do you create more opportunities for more Bondi to Manly bushwalks to be created for Sydney? And that's really the topic of the third round table. Love anybody who wants to come to come. That's my sales pitch. When's your day? Twenty-seventh and twenty-eighth of February. Yeah. So um I, and you can get like gosh. It's like if you look up Humanitics, which is like Eventbrite, but it's a social enterprise. Um or my um my website is ethicalfields.com and that like follow the links from there to um, uh, to the 2020 Commonwealth 2020 page.